Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and today's guest is Javier Marty. He is the CEO and founder of DiviRod, and Javier's experience is built uh, from managing multi-million dollar international projects for space and earth sciences. And today we're going to learn about his product, DiviRod, and, and what he's got going on with uh, managing water information in the industry. So welcome, Mar Javier. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Sean. Uh, that's great. Great. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Javier. You know, how you got started in the business and, you know, what, what made you start uh, the, the company with DiviRod? Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, my company has to be started from the beginning. Um, I come from the originally from Spain, from the south. Okay. Um, being exposed to a lot of drought uh, environment. I couldn't shower in the morning when I was a kid. That was that really was not a pleasant thing to have. <laughs> and um, but my experience in uh, my degree in engineering took me to very different places. I've been in, living in four continents by now, and um, had the experience to work in the uh, you know in the outer space, in radio telescopes, in environment here in the United States. And at some point of my career, I, you know, I pulled together all the experiences, all the uh, the skill sets, and uh, brought it into something that um, should be answering the question to the one of the larger problems that we have, which is water. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only the scarcity, but also you know when water comes in in big time forms. So I started David Roth back in 2016. Uh, it was a great experience to put together a very unique, unique technology that was uh, addressing some of the challenges that uh, measuring water at large or understanding water at large has. And um, yeah, the route is, uh, has been full of uh, very good experiences. So well, technology to where we are now. Yeah, so, okay. So you've been, you've, you've had this great background of experiences in, in, in the technology world and, and, and trying to solve some problems, but Tell us what this product really is, because I mean, inquiring minds want to know, like, what does this thing do, or how does this work? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish with this this product? Well, the product, what you see at first, is something like this. It's a it's a it's a very small device. It needs to be applied power, and it starts recording signals. Um, but the real product is not that. It's, it's the data as a service that we offer. And uh, with, with information that we capture using the sensors, we basically transform that into insights of water at, um, in, many, in many forms. We look at uh, water levels, we look at water in the ground, like soil moisture. We're looking at uh, snow accumulation, ice forming, uh, snow water equivalent, uh, tidal changes, waves, everything water. And, um, well, you know, even even so, we're looking into ways to transform the, the information that we're receiving to get also a rate of precipitation, which is quite important when you're looking at, uh, you know, how the effects of flooding effects are ha happening and, and, you know, how they originate from uh, from the rain events. Mm -hmm. So is this device like working off of, um, you know, conductivity readings or something? Or is it, I mean, how, I mean, radar, I mean what, how does this thing collect this, like, water level or water information data. I'm, I'm curious to understand how that thing works. Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, unique device in the sense that it's not uh, the typical thing that you put in the water and gets a rhythm. It's not a thermometer either. It captures uh, something more complex. So when we put these devices on the ground, what we're doing is listening to the echoes of signals that are coming from satellites. So imagine a big radar every element uh, that we install in the uh, in, on the ground is is basically contributing to form a gigantic radar so mm -hmm. each of the signals that are uh, coming from the space and hitting the ground are basically bouncing off and capturing a signal a signature which is somewhat and to a certain extent uh, proportional to the water insights that we're looking for mm -hmm. so using the combination of all those reflections and all the devices that we have out there we cover geographies and we cover the we manage to get a very good understanding of water levels of water in every form as i said before from liquid to to actually snow and solid mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you talk about you know the real value of this this product it's not really the actual device collecting the information it's it's really the data 
uh, management system that's running behind it all to help you interpret what what it all means, right? Yeah, we're building a platform, a water platform where okay. water the information is is available, uh, and water information as such is not that useful. I mean, like uh, three feet there, twenty over there, is not something that gives us much insight. What really gives us insight is what we do with that data. When we transform the data into information and then into knowledge and ultimately into actions, which are preventing you know risks to happen or mitigating risk or diminishing the the chance of getting impacted by effect of uh, the effects of uh, water. Oh. So that's that's where the true value is coming from is the information that is converted into action. Okay, so. So you're kind of creating, you, you mentioned a network, so to speak, you know, talk about this water data network and, and, you know, what does that look like? And is it like a global scale water data network or is it like a regional, maybe state specific or a county specific? I mean, what does this water data network consist of and look like? Yeah, when people think about, I mean, we're trying to be global, but when people think about global, they think about the entire planet. Mm -hmm. And um, we're not the satellite company. We're not having a satellite constantly spinning the earth and covering areas which may or may not be interesting to, to, the, to the customers. We're actually building this network in places that matter. So, mm -hmm. for example, we are uh, bringing this to where, uh, you know, some of our water infrastructure is located to supply water for you and I to drink or for people to irrigate or simply by communities or corporations which are living with the water somehow, like uh, by the coastal environment, suffering floods, suffering uh, of uh, seasonal and more frequent, unfortunately, events uh, that are, you know, sometimes devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, bringing, we're bringing that technology at the power of that network where our customers need it, not somewhere else. We're, we're not trying to populate the entire planet with... Uh, with technology Water data. And, and, and mm -hmm. stuff. So when a customer comes to you, they're they're saying, hey, Divi Rod, you know, we we are interested in having a better understanding of our water infrastructure or our water uh, impacts to our community, right? Is that is that kind of how they're coming to you guys and saying, you know, we want to know more about how we can protect or how we can build you know, better solutions to, to manage our water infrastructure. Yeah, our customers are, you know, the personas that we are uh, essentially addressing are, you know, some people are working in water management, uh, water resource management. So those people are interested in, in managing water to the ultimate extent. So where in places of scarcity, for example, every water drop counts. And these are people who are interested in having access to a very accurate, very precise uh, measure of how much water they have and how they're using it as they are, you know, managing the entire watershed along the uh, along the way. We have other type of customers which are like, um, you know, counties that are trying to improve their uh, resiliency plans, mm -hmm. and uh, they do that in conjunction with engineering firms, which are necessitating ultimately of data. And uh, typically, whenever you have a problem. Uh, very likely you don't have data to begin with. So we're bringing this augmentation of data to help understand what are the mitigation uh, um, you know, actions that can be taken at county level, at city level, municipality, region, state, whatever you want. And, um, and then we have another line, which uh, we'll touch, uh, uh, I suppose, in the course of this uh, uh, conversation, but we're also serving the prop tech industry. Uh, some people don't realize, but um, on top of our roofs, not only residential, but mostly commercial, like imagine a large uh, logistic facility, mm -hmm. they're collecting, these are flat surfaces, which are collecting a lot of dirt. A lot of water. Yeah. And dirt, yeah, dirt, then water, then this dirt is going into the drains, they clog, the water started pulling up, or, or like we have seen in the Northeastern uh, events that we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, snow accumulation on roofs. You got to be quick before your roof is taking too much active load on it. So our customers come from many different uh, interactions and the common theme of them is the water and the risk that they could impose into their 
operations, their business, their lives, their their communities. So this information and, and why people are coming to you to have this information at their fingertips is to, to make informed decisions about how to react or respond to, you know, water events. Maybe that's a lack of water event. Maybe that's, you know, like I'm in a drought or uh, I'm getting, you know, inundated with, you know, flood level rain events. Like um, talk about how you know, the systems can be deployed to help manage these types of events for maybe a community who wants to really, you know, get a handle on having information ahead of time to anticipate or better understand the impacts that do occur so they can maybe do some planning to address it in the future. How does that work and how can you set up systems to help them? So let's take an example. We're working with um, um, a particular municipality in Europe, which is suffering of, uh, of recurring flooding events. Mm -hmm. And um, the floods are coming from three potentially different uh, watersheds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's rain events, uh, rain comes, uh, when, when it comes, it pours, essentially. And these intermittent, intermittent uh, uh, rivers are actually filling up with water. Levels go up get to the city, the city is a disaster. So what we do to deploy there in those cases is we don't, we're not necessarily just deploying in the city. We go away from the city ahead of the curve and you know, uh, upstream in the, in the watershed to understand where the actual um, contribution or excess of water is coming from. Mm -hmm. So we look at the hydrology of the terrain and then we deploy accordingly, strategically so that we can issue early warnings when the flood is occurring upstream, you see a-, a So a the community flow. downstream will know, hey, they need to get out or get the high ground, right? You got it. Or, you know, it's from dumb things like moving your car out of the way, so you don't want to have it flush out uh, with water. Right. Or taking other precautions like, okay, understanding, okay, we have to raise a little bit the walls, or we do have to put a contention or a diversion of the, of the river somewhere else to mitigate the amount of water that flows through the through the city. I mean, all of our planning, uh, the cities have made plans in the in the past, especially like uh, looking back to Europe, they were all around water. Like you establish your community around a river, right. next to the sea, next to next to water, because the water is, is so fundamental That's, to our lives. Right. Yeah. So um, they they have the uh, the planning around the city, and they, they basically the rivers have been there forever. And wow. uh, as you can as you can imagine, the rivers are going to win the battle with the uh, built environment. Now, are these is your system able to like help maybe coastal communities as it relates to you know I don't know tidal tidal situations or or you know can you protect can they be used to protect the coastal communities in in that regard if if they're deployed in a way that gives enough of a warning system or helps them better understand maybe how they should, uh, like we think you're talking about earlier, about building some infrastructure, like bar you know some barriers to protect. I mean, are they being used in that way too? Or can they be, can it be used that way? Yeah, definitely. We have uh, uh, systems all along the East Coast, uh -huh. all the way from Maine down to Florida. And um, people in, in the communities, they're using it, the, the information that they're getting, it's, it's basically used in different manners. Some people are, using it to you know, improve their infrastructure projects. Some people are using it to understand their uh, maritime uh, conditions so that they can, they're boaters and they want to go out mm -hmm. and they need to capture the tide. Um, harbors are essentially a very interesting use case because you know, when a container with a, a ship container with uh, you know, a massive cargo is coming into the harbor, not only you have to have a pier available to, to dock, but also you have to have the right type to, to get into the harbor. Right. Because, you, know, you might, you know, uh, dry, you dock the, the water, right? yeah, dry dock the old <laughs> ship and that would be good. Yeah. So, so when you think about that case, um, you know, an hour of uh, this cargo in, you know, outside the harbor is burning a hundred thousand dollars an hour. So, you know, optimizing uh, maritime transportation, Living, understanding the floods, getting ahead of the, of uh, of you know for any resilience planning, or ultimately you know how you know how much risk do you really have? 
Because every time you get a warning from many of the uh, typical institutions, you say, you guys are going to get a flood event. Like, what is that? Is that coming mm -hmm. this way? Is that coming that way? There is no certainty. And we need to bring that certainty to the communities and to the corporations and to the to the people who are living next to the water. So in the instance of, say, like, you know, uh, you, you mentioned along the coast there, you've got these these units deployed. Um, are you, for the, your for your customers, are you creating, like, visual dashboards for them to see, you know, tide elevations, timeline of, you know, the flow of, of the tide. And so they know, you know, the peak optimum timeline to bring, I mean, is that the level of this type of water network uh, that your data network you're developing? Does it, is it, is it that kind of a solution for the, for the customer to see? So, so there's, as I said before, there's several type of customers from the very advanced user and they don't want to have any dashboard. They want to just have a stream of data mm -hmm. getting into their uh, to their systems, and they will do whatever analysis. Imagine a large data consumer like an insurance company. That would be the typical way of interfacing with us. Uh, the second the, the second level of user will have access to a dashboard. It could be a geographical information system interface type of thing, mm -hmm. where, for example, you take S3 or 40 Geo or any of the of the usual suspects. And then the data flows through that informational system and create that awareness that they're requiring to have. And they're capturing the data on a geospatial and also on a temporal basis. So you can actually look at the movie on what really happens. Mm -hmm. The less sophisticated, not necessarily the most, uh, the, the worst is the one who just uses a phone. And the phone is creating a snippet, which is, okay, I'm by this place, what is it? current situation, can I look at it? And then people are accessing some sort of a snippet that shows a graph and some basic information easy to ingest mm -hmm. so that people can understand what the situation is uh, relative to water in that area. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> you know, what? how important is it to, I guess, accelerate, you know, our knowledge and, and understanding of, of water risks you know in you know in society i mean and I, I think most people right now you know if they really thought about it they they've experienced a lot of these types of natural disasters so to speak or events that are you know pretty devastating in a sense right i mean how how, how can we you know use this to help you know understand our, our risk better yeah, so society needs to be aware of where we are with, uh, you know, the risk of water. Mm -hmm. And we're one of the companies, the, only, the few companies which is treating water as a liability. So you're liable, your liabilities are there because you live by the water. And sometimes we don't even think about it. I myself, I live in a house which is categorized by FEMA to be in a floodplain in a 100 year flood plain. Okay, what does it mean? Colorado suffered a flood uh, event in 2013, massive. And uh, I was just moved in the house. I wasn't aware of, the, of that situation. Um, although I have read about it, you don't pay attention, like a 100 year flood. That's yeah, it never <laughs> happens. It's 100 years from exactly. now, right. <laughs> exactly, so, so you don't pay attention to those things. But the, the truth is that when it happens, this one, you write like, oh my gosh, what happened here? Uh, am I going to get washed? I was helping my neighbor across the street mm -hmm. to bring, you know, everything from boxes to uh, to dolls, to doll houses from the grandmother, everything up there to the to the high ground, because they were, you know, I live by the, the front branch, so very close to the mountains, and um, in a matter of hours, his basement was full of water up to twelve feet, twelve mm. feet of water like massive. Um, we need a little bit of bringing up things. Like I remember lifting up the television and putting it halfway in the stairs, hoping that nothing happened. And in the end, my house was still not affected at all. So the thing, the moral of this uh, story, um, and I apologize if I took a little bit longer, no. is the fact that um, the people are not aware of the type of risks that we're living with. Mm -hmm. And um, the climate is changing. The situation is uh, is basically giving us, putting us in front of more and more risks of water, more rains whenever you're not expecting rain. 
snowstorms in the middle of the, I'm, I'm going to exaggerate, but in the middle of the summer, tell the Texans the type of storms that they had last year, that they were expecting that or not. Um, yeah, they to, weren't expecting that. No, absolutely no, not. No one was expecting this. And the truth is that there's so many things that are changing and we're not in the, you know, it's not that this has changed. It's changing and changing means an evolution. And we don't know what this is going to end up looking like in right. 10, 20 years from now. Hopefully we will stabilize, but, you know, maybe we're not, we're not spending enough time in our history to deal with that change. But um, people need to create more awareness of uh, the risks that are, you know, exposed to. Well, and I think right now um, society is really honing in on climate change is a big issue. And, and obviously you you have the ability with this product to kind of measure the effects of climate change. Are you working with companies that are studying the effects of climate change and deploying the, these tools to really kind of like get a grip on, hey, I'm going to do some trend analysis here to show you that, you know, we don't have the water we used to have here because of the climate and and here's some trends. And, and are you working with people like that, to, to, you know, and building the data, the water data network to help them synthesize the information to make, you know, scientific judgments on that? Ultimately, people could actually use our data lake for that purpose. In the long mm -hmm. run, we mm -hmm. need to, you know, we need to gather more evidence. I mean, we've been in existence. I mean, our oldest sensor it dates back from 2000, end of 2018. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at four years of data for yeah. that one sensor. And as the network grows, it exploits more geographies and it stays longer, the data lake is going to be a great tool to understand you know, the trends that we're experimenting. And um, we are not working directly with a company that is actually looking into that, but they're looking into a derived uh, product for that. For example, uh, you're looking into insurance companies, which are, of course, need to insure people. Yeah, they're interested in it because they got to underwrite the, the, the businesses that are, you know, being affected by these exactly. disasters. Exactly. So you look at people who are uh, using this type of data to understand where are we going, because they need to measure the risk in one way or another. Then we're also working with people who are, you know, communities which are simply not having enough data because they never had it. The mm -hmm. closest uh, NOAA station is like, you know, 50, 60, 80 miles away from them. And they live in areas which are constantly flooding because they see that and they see that happening more and more often. So ultimately, ev everybody is looking at those effects of climate mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. and doing something about it. Um, but uh, somebody like a scientific community, we, we still, we're open to work with universities and academia. Um, but uh, well, we're not, what, uh, what about we're not like, you know, the federal government, like FEMA, you know, or the weather, you know, or NOAA or the, you know, NOAA is a, I mean, or, yeah. or you know, um, or NASA, I mean, uh, I mean, they need to know about the water and, the, you know, especially some of those big, you know, or the military, right? I mean, let's talk about, the, you know, those opportunities that could be out there to deploy this type of technology to help them do their work. Tell me what you think there in that space. Yeah, I have had a story, I mean, a, a history of uh, working for uh, federally funded projects and uh, uh, institutional uh, co governmental money to build you know, crazy stuff like big uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, the main problem that I see is the speed of action. I mean, uh, ultimately, we're a company. We're a for-profit company. Entertaining a long sales cycle or a long RFI or FQ that comes from an institution, it basically drains the small companies. And mm -hmm. we're a small company altogether. We're, we're you know, we're not a startup uh, uh, like it started yesterday, but we don't have the, still, the yeah. You don't have the the bandwidth the and or or the resources to kind of you know do that type of marketing approach to to secure a contract in that space. You probably need to look for a partner that's Correct. already in that space. That's a big government you know contractor, uh, a Boeing or you know some other big company <laughs> that's a military you know contractor, and, and then deploy your 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 application with them through their contract, probably right. 
Correct. And uh, so we're trying to be smart here and we're trying to partner with uh, the right uh, folks mm -hmm. in order to attend as many, uh, you know, the interested parties uh, which are out there. And certainly the government needs to have this type of data. NOAA themselves, they will be uh, a natural customers of ours uh, going forward. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a question of time. And uh, we are... The longer we stay around, the, the, the larger the geography that we're covering, the more valuable will be our data to them. So, so a, a couple uh, a couple episodes back, I had Dr. Sylvia Earle uh, on the episode on the on the show, and she is one of the former NOAA um, uh, researchers, uh, uh, lead scientist uh, for NOAA, and she worked for the or that that uh, federal or agency. And yeah, she, you know, she was really involved with the oceanography work and um, I got to imagine your application would be ideal for those guys. Yeah. I mean, they ought to be buying you, buying that stuff up and, and working with you at a very intimate level. Because, you know, when I think about, you know, water and, and either scarcity or, or, you know, the overabundance of it, it's, you know, at certain times of the year during these events, I mean, companies or uh, municipalities, they, how can they use this to really deploy and support resiliency approaches and projects that they're trying to figure out, you know, in their, their, you know, uh, communities. Okay. So first of all, if Noah is listening, you know, this is my name, reach out, happy to help. <laughs> uh, second on the, um, on the, on the front of how people can, you know, how can we help with the resiliency planning? Um, we want to be there. Uh, we can support with the places that we have already deployed. We can already provide that data and supply that data on a 24-7 uh, basis. Uh, for places that don't have any sort of data infrastructure from us, we're happy to bring in uh, and deploy our network. Um, I didn't mention that before, but one of the advantages is that we're not charging. We're not selling our units. Uh, this is part of our infrastructure. So you have to think about our network as a physical network as a cell phone company. So you don't buy a cell tower next to you. You actually just not even buy a, a phone anymore. You just lease it and, uh, and access the service. So this right. is what we're offering. So you don't buy, you don't have to make CapEx. You just have to contact us. We need this data needs for this particular application, for this particular use case, and we will deploy accordingly and we'll provide the service to you. And with How that information- fast? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then you can start making decisions on, you know, your resiliency planning and, and what you should be doing to prepare for, you know, uh, the next disaster. Uh, right. I mean, um, can you can can the products be used to help with infrastructure, you know, managing infrastructure pieces? I mean, that's kind of related to resiliency, but, you know, talk about how it would be really applicable to that <coughs> aspect. So. We're already uh, working with infrastructure uh, owners, like, um, I mean, I said before in PropTech uh, with uh, large warehouses and people who are, um, you know, have assets uh, very close to the water or exposed to water. But we're also, for example, in the, uh, if you think about dams and uh, reservoirs and mm -hmm. um, some of our customers are managing um, large reservoirs with dams and all those are what I would call, consider a critical infrastructure, not only because of you know what they manage, but the impact if they overflow or they uh, they, they run out of water. So we're already uh, addressing those problems. An area that we would love to get into is in the uh, in the energy business because I'm thinking about all these flood events and how they immediately you you read in the newspapers like you know. New Orleans, uh, two million people in, in, in Louisiana just got out of electricity. They, uh -huh. They're in the dark. Then why is that happening? Because the substations are very close to the water. They, they're, you know, they're flooded. Yep. And until somebody can actually go there when it's safe, they can't repair it. So imagine that then now you have a device in place which is telling you, first of all, you're getting, you're getting flooded the the flood is stopped and then the, the the water starts to drain you can wait until you have the right type of information to be effective and deploy to the substations that matter so that's another another way that we could actually help with uh, infrastructure 
in that. What regard. about utilities? Uh, and I'm thinking, uh, like you mentioned, dams, but a lot of those companies that are managing dams are are you know really managing them because that's their water, re that's their drinking water, right? That's mm -hmm. you know they're they're using that to store their drinking water. Can these devices be used to, um, you know, quantify? the volume of water that they have in their reservoir at a really good, you know, tight level. 100%. And, uh, and that's something that we are already doing. And some of our customers are benefiting from understanding, you know, not to the acre feet, but to the acre inch, if they want, in, in terms of the availability of water. And um, we have uh, one of our customers uh, manages, uh, we have deployed along the entire watershed including everything that starts in the mountains with collecting water from the rain, snow accumulation, snow melting, and then along the river, then they have about five different reservoirs. And these guys are feeding, are, are basically providing the drinking water for 60, uh, 40 to 60% of the population of Madrid. So we're looking about a huge capital in Europe, which is already managing the water in a way, using our information to be absolutely precise because in Spain, every water counts. And for those people, I mean, you know, Madrid is a growing city and there's a lot of people drinking and there's a lot of people uh, coming to the to the capital of Spain and, and getting into, you know, the difficulties of not having, if they have restrictions, they better manage it properly. And um, and we're helping them this year to, to start increasing the level of accuracy and precision in their, in their management. And they're, you know, thus far is, it's a fantastic project that is, is is giving us a lot of return, and them as well, of course. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, you know, what what does it look like for an engagement with a customer with you guys? I mean, like, do you guys sell a package deal? Is it a license agreement for you know a year or two years? I mean, how does this engagement work for them? And then, you know, explain a little bit about what you know how they get this information to, I mean, you kind of mentioned it goes, you know, they could take it raw data or they can get a custom screen. I mean, how does it work for your engagement piece with the customer? So they can kind of like, if someone's listening, say, you know, I, I think I want something from, from Javier. Let me, let me get a hold of him because I like what he's telling me. Yeah. So we work in a, on a subscription model and what you subscribe to is to have a data access. So you access your, the data that is relevant to your use case. And, and basically engage with that subscription model. If we need to deploy the network, um, we will work with you or with uh, somebody else to find the most appropriate location to, to install for the better readings for, for your use case. And, um, and then there will be some, you know, some agreements to sign for hosting the device and it will not cost anything to anybody because we pay for that. Mm -hmm. And then all you do is just to subscribe to the, uh, to the data and um, you know if you're a big customer you you buy data sets and if you're a medium customer you buy a particular dashboard to interface with the data products and so on so forth and um, and it's very simple i mean we we go all the way from subscriptions which are uh, you know um, a few uh, a couple of thousand bucks to you know larger subscriptions for for different customers uh -huh, uh -huh. So if I was an individual, I'm a resident, you know, a local guy, just, you know, I don't, I'm you not are. a big company. I'm not a big company. <laughs> I'm not a big company. Well, what would, would your application help me in, you know, how would it help me if I wanted some information from you? I mean, is, is there any realistic applic application for engaging Divi Rod at, you know, an individual level versus, it's got to be a company. It really needs to be something that's a little more, you know, uh, applicable well, to uh, you know. You know, I'm just kind of curious. What do you think? So individuals can do two things. One is that um, they you could actually join what we call the water team. The okay. water team is you know people like you, like me, who are concerned about water. We live well. I don't, but you live by the water, for example, and you want to know you know, you want to contribute to this global understanding. I want to have part of the network. I want to host it in my place mm -hmm. because I know that with that, that data that is co being collected, it's not necessarily that I'm going to get a direct benefit, but I, I actually contribute to something that will affect me at some point. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So other companies will actually mix something with that data to, to, to improve your situation, to get, to contribute to these. I mean, we just have to think about contributing to the larger good. And, and that, is, uh, that is the way that people and individuals can, can contribute here. Uh, so if you're living by the coast, if you're living by, by a river, you see that happens all, you know, flood happens all the time and you want to have an impact in, in your life and your neighbors and your cities, just reach us. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be exploring. I mean, at the end of the day, we need to put this somewhere. Without this, uh-huh. oops, you can't get the information, time. right? There's no yeah. information. And, um, and, and, that is, uh, and that is the trick because if we have uh, this, the uh, network out there, the type of information that we're collecting is actually completely different to the type of information that has been already collected or is being collected somewhere else. So mm-hmm. we, we differentiate ourselves tremendously. Once we put this thing on a place, we understand water. You know, um, it just occurred to me another uh, you know, entity that would be probably hugely interested in this. And, and I'm, I'm going to ask this question just to see if it, it can do this. But um, in, a, in a previous life, before I got into consulting and, and doing what I do, I used to work for the state of Indiana in, in, in their uh, water management group. And I did a lot of surveys of the rivers of the state. Uh, and, and as part of that, I'd go to all the USGS gauging stations and, and, and basically, you know, understand what the water levels are of the rivers so I could calculate what my flow rates are at those any given times. And then I would sample at these particular bridge locations and, and I'd sample for pesticide um, uh, levels. And then I would calculate a loading calculation of how much of that stuff was in the water. Right. Mm-hmm. Can your can your application be deployed to actually measure flow rate from, you know, the level of the, uh, the water at a given time at a bridge location or something like that? Is that something this could do? Because, you know, that would take away a lot of infrastructure Fantastic. needs. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware because that's a, that's a piece that we don't like to talk about much, but actually is the key to the type of data and the quality that we're offering. So one of the things that uh, for everybody who's, let's say, familiar with, uh, with sensors and stuff, everything needs to be calibrated, right? Most of the time they, they have drifts and the readings need to be readjusted so that they get through it proper readings. Nothing of this, nothing of this is our problem. We actually are self-calibrated because of the, the nature of the system that we have put in place. We're calibrated with these beautiful satellites which are out there mm-hmm. that we're know very precisely they are maintained to the uh, nanosecond if that tells you something and um, we built this thing you know given my past experience in the space i built this thing in a way that is um, always falling back safe so there is no need for maintenance so the the ultimate problem that we would have is that we run out of energy to power this thing or we don't have a you know if we have a solar panel we we don't have sun for a month and then boom the whole thing depletes or we don't have access to the grid or any other form. So the only problem that we may encounter and we have encountered out there is the lack of uh, power. But if provided there is power, this thing is providing a rhythm which is immediately comparable, whatever it is in the globe. So if you're looking at, uh, we have sensors in Europe, as I said before, we have a sensor in Venice, in Italy. The reading of that sensor is directly comparable to any readings that were taken in the East Coast in um, all, all the way over here across the Atlantic. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the, uh, we're using the same source. We're directly com- putting together comparable data sets. We're not guessing like, oh, this guy is drifting, the other guy is going. And the, no, it's direction. accurate. It's accurate. Yeah. Bob took a reading of looking at a, you know, a ruler on the, on the map or on the, on the wall. No. Forget about all those inaccuracies. We're bringing consistent set of, uh, of data that is directly comparable. Therefore, it gives us a region at a scale, a unique understanding and no one else, to my knowledge, has been able to do thus far. Mm. Another, another industry, another industry that I think could benefit is, you know, the railroad industry. You know, there's a lot of derailments that happen in the railroad industry because of flooding and they don't know it, you know, and they're in the middle of the night driving their trains you know, 
and, and they're not aware of a potential flood environment that they're going to be going into because, you know, it the, the, the rain event or the snow melt or whatever happened way upstream and now it's making its way down. They don't know it and they just drive right into it and they derail. I mean, if they had some warning signals ahead of time and this information was available to them in real time, right, they would know, hey, they could get a notification that, hey, in this area of the country or this area in, the, in this part of the, you know, the state, you're going to be encountering flooding events. Uh, you, you may not want to be, um, you know, because they could be flash floods, right? Things could happen real quick and that would be good information to know. Definitely. Transportation is affected by, by water at large, not only flooding events or ice on top of roads. How many traffic accidents you, you can get out of the, um, sorry, my network, I think is a bit unstable. It's a little fuzzy there, but yeah, it's okay. 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 Yeah. Um, the um, so what I was saying, transportation actually is, is 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 an area that benefits from an understanding of water, how it interacts with, you know, as you say, rail railways, um, maritime, as I said, in the harbors, uh, road conditions. Imagine, you know, uh, how much, how many accidents you have because of snow, because of ice, and. Those are measurements which are not typically taken with a camera. I mean, yeah, you can see uh -huh. a patch, but it's already like too obvious. And uh -huh. you know, you can see things after the after the fact. But with our technology, we can all always enhance the you know how much water there is on a certain surface. And this is something that we see, for example, in our prop tech industry, that we're looking at roofs and we are also, we, we get uh, to to understand whenever there is an accumulation of snow side of the roof or another side of the roof or pulling around a drain or something like that. We're very good at assessing all these uh, surfaces. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, I think that uh, this information is, is going to be vital for understanding our, our water infrastructure and the needs of uh, potentially supporting resiliency uh, challenges that we face in society. And, and, and it seems like you're just kind of getting started with creating a lot of this. I mean, you've been doing it for a few years now and, and you're really trying to get some traction. Um, uh, I mean, is there competition in this market for you guys too, that's similar to what you guys are doing that, that, that is out there that, you know, or are you kind of, you know, you got a, a leg up on the uh, competition in a sense. You, you've been out there a bit, and and um, you're really the, the the you know the leader here. I I mean, curious to your thoughts there. Yeah, Wh whoever thinks there is no competition is a fool. There is competition, <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's comp there's competition. Um, I wish them luck. We are very uh, very you know pressing on. Um, we have unique distinct features that others don't have. I mean, some people are just looking at the coast and they have, uh, you know, this little thing that they put uh, next to the coast and they're looking down. So that's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, we come up with uh, something which is more sophisticated and provides a different type of, uh, of level of data quality. Um, with the same type of system, as I was saying before, the information that we retrieve at the coast or on top of a roof or in Europe, or in, in, in another setting, it's all building up to this network information. So it's not just a single localization, it's that this network is gonna capture like 24 seven snapshots of what's going on in the planet, it's whatever we building. deploy. It's just building on each be, other. Yeah, and because we can compare data, we're actually gonna be very good at you know, providing a good assessment of how what happens in, you know, in Florida will be now happen in South Carolina and, and you know, north, northern uh, eastern part of the country. So we're going to be able to see those correlations in a way that until now has not been possible. Mm. You know, there's a lot of concern about, we, I'm going back to climate change again, about, you know, sea level rise and, and, and the measuring of that, and it keeps increasing. And, um, you know, there's, um, there's a golf course that uh, uh, over on the East Coast that is, is kind of, basically in, on the verge of going underwater um and, and you know they're worried about flooding 
uh, and title issues that, you know, is consuming the golf course. You know, that seems like another application of, you know, deploying this and, you know, these, these devices to kind of measure that a little more accurately to kind of get a better feel for um, how do I uh, address, you know, the, the flood implication or the, 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 the tide rise implication. So I don't inundate, you know, inundate my, uh, the golf course. Right. I mean, you got, you got people want to go play golf. They're, they're members. They, they don't want to have to be shut down because they, I mean, I know that sounds pretty petty, but I guess, you know, I don't know. I mean, it could be used that way, right? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think at the end of the day, what you're claiming at is that we need data to have access to information and take a good course of actions whenever whenever we know what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, as long as we ignore data, uh, we're going to be looking at a future which is like, okay, we're making decisions on the go, like oh, reactive. It's all reactive, reactive. instead of proactive, right? Yeah, yeah. So we cannot play golf anymore. So what do we do? We put we move the hole over there. Right. Uh, you know, that that is the, the sad part of the story. So I take a personal commitment because I I I am the one who believes I at least I do believe that if we don't take a stand in taking an action for ourselves by ourselves but as private citizens, as as persons living in this planet, as mm-hmm. as corporations, I feel responsible of doing something for this. Mm-hmm. So my contribution, my small grain of salt, of, of, of sand here is this technology, is this access to data, is this changing the ability to people to discern and become aware that living with water is beautiful, but at the same time is very risky. So let's be aware of who we live with in order to live a, lo- a long life together. Yeah, right. No, that sounds good. I mean, when you talk about this technology, so say you're an engineering firm and uh, you want to use this water data so you can use it to create models for your customer because, you know, you need access to this data so you can use it to lay over, you know, some uh, some ESRI or GIS uh, maps and things like that. So you can create some views uh, for, you know, location intelligence type stuff. I mean, it, it, are you seeing like engineering firms reach out to you to, to, to access your data, to, to do, if, you know, to use it in that, in that way. Yeah. And uh, we're, uh, we're actually working closely with, uh, I'm not going to disclose here, but uh, we're cl- working closely with engineering firms, which are, uh, you know, located in, in the, uh, in the Gulf and in Florida, and they're very active in assessing counties, municipalities, and, uh, you know, public institutions, which, necessitate of this type of information in order to make a, you know advancement to their infrastructure to their resiliency plans and so on and so forth and um, we're always open to do that because what is clear is that at the end of the day everybody's using models and the models are the models are just models so you get a few data points that you fit a curve through it and then you get a model and some people will say oh we have a better model because we fit it differently um, what it say is that why guessing when you can actually measure and be certain of what's going on at the place that you need the response from. So you right. have a question about your house. I mean, it's like if I ask you, Sean, are you worried about your house or your neighbor's house? You're worried. About well, your yeah, about my house first <laughs> and then the neighbor's second. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it's not being selfish. It's just being practical. Right. I don't care what happens in, you know, uh, at this point, if I'm getting flooded in Colorado, I don't care what's happening in Indiana because right. it's far away from me. So why right. do I need a data point that is trustworthy at Indiana if it is not trustworthy in Colorado? We want right. to bring this certainty. We want to make sure that people like you and I, at the end of the day, is like uh, you ordered a pizza on a phone and you can see this guy driving the, you know, the motorbike or the car all around the neighborhood and coming to, to you. And you're certain the pizza will be delivered and it's going to be tasty and warm and everything. So you're getting ready for it. When you're getting an alert, like there's a flood alert, there is a storm coming, anywhere expected between five and 20 inches, give me a break. What do I take? Five? What do I take? 20? Is it two? We need to be more certain about how we live with the water. Yeah. And, um, and this is what we're trying to bring is that certainty and certainty. Certainty only comes from having boots on the ground and uh, having reliable systems and efficient systems to deliver that sort of data. 
Uh, this is good. I mean, I'm I, I, I I'm going to have to at some point do a separate uh WebEx teams call for you to kind of give me a peek behind the the screen to show me how this data, you know, looks on your screens and how you're using it. Cause I'm, I'm really intrigued about it. You know, I work for an engineering company by my day job and uh, water's a big deal uh, for us as a company. And I can't imagine that this technology wouldn't be applicable to our own company uh, and for our clients. So, you know, I'm going to try to see if I can come up with an opportunity to, to get you introduced to some of our, water uh, management uh, technology folks to, um, you know, get it, get in front of them. I think that'd be great. Um, well, Javier, I mean, this has been a great conversation. I think we're kind of peeling away, you know, a little, little by little more information about what this product can do and, and, and the concepts behind it. There's still more to be learned about it, obviously. And I, I think I encourage uh, listeners to, you know, look into what, you know, you guys do and, and, and go to your website. So, for the listeners, tell us how to get a hold of you can access information about your company and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, the website is simple, dvrod.com. Dvrod is spelled uh, right there. And um, if you want, you can follow us on social media. We're very active. We try to be like not con constantly bombarding with information. We want to make an educational tool of social media. So LinkedIn, we post, uh, you know, once per week or one every, once every other week, uh, Instagram. I mean, all the all the things, all the gadgets that are available. Getting hold of us is very easy nowadays. Um, just move on and make a you know we're two one click away. Basically. That's right. That's right. Well, and, and for the listeners, I'll have Javier's uh, contact information on my website, so you can get a hold of it there. Um, you know, this has been an insightful conversation because, and I, you, know, we probably could go a lot more in detail and 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 you know get into this uh, aspect of all the ins and outs of the product. But you know, I think we're we're scratching the surface enough that's going to get the answers to people's like, ah, I need some more information because this is really good. And I really applaud what you guys are doing. I think having real time accurate data is so key to helping us manage uh, water information in our system or in our country and our local communities. Um, you know, keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate that. And, and you're doing a fantastic job. Uh, I, I'm going to take you up on letting you, you know, show me what you do. I want to see this because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in it. So, um, well, thanks for coming on the show today. And uh, we'll get this out, uh, you know, next week. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting some feedback. And then you can share with your customers too. So it'd be great. Definitely. Thank you, Sean, for having me here. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.